Yeah. Uh, so we are really um, honored today to have as our guest, Dr. Peter Hotez, who um, uh, is uh, an icon in the world uh, of vaccinology and infectious disease. Dr. Hotez is Dean of the National School of Tropical Medicine and a professor of pediatrics and molecular virology and microbiology at Baylor, uh, not so, so far from us. He co-directs the Texas Children's Center for Vaccine Development and, um, it, and uh, has the Texas Children's Hospital Endowed Chair of Tropical Pediatrics. He has several other titles that I won't um, uh, go through at the moment because um, I want to touch on some other aspects um, of his um, of his sorry we are watching some things of his uh, career. So Dr. Otis is an internationally recognized physician scientist in neglected tropical diseases and vaccine development. As co-director of the Texas Children's CBD, he leads a team and product development partnership for developing new vaccines for hookworm infection, schistosomiasis, leishmaniasis, chagas, and importantly, the coronaviruses, SARS, MERS, and now COVID. He has been a champion, um, a true champion for access to vaccines globally and in the U.S. As part of that, in December of 2021, he co-led efforts at the Texas Children's Center for Vaccine Development to develop low-cost recombinant protein COVID vaccine technologies for global health, which received emergency use, uh, use authorization in India and Indonesia, um, and again, has been done um, uh, in an effort to be sure that um, uh, to address global disparities in vaccine access. His human hookworm vaccine is accelerating rapidly through clinical trials. And so I think for all of the scientists on this call, um, this is a project he began as an MD PhD student in the 1980s. So that to me talks a lot about resilience. Um, Dr. Otez obtained his undergraduate degree in molecular biophysics from Yale, his PhD at Rockefeller, and his MD from Cornell. He has authored more than 680 original papers indexed on PubMed and is the author of five single author books. Um, the two most recent ones um, are well-known vaccines did not cause Rachel's autism uh, and his brand new book, Preventing the Next Pandemic, Vaccine Diplomacy in a Time of Anti-Science. Um, I, I could go on about the international impact that he's had. I will say that he is an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences has been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize um, with his colleague, Maria Elena Botazzi, who you may have heard of in another context now, um, and um, won in 2023, the National Academy of Medicine's David and Beatrix Humberg Award for the Biomedical Sciences and Clinical Medicine. He also, um, uh, and I was privileged to see this in person, won the Anthony Fauci Courage and Leadership Award from IDSA just this past year. Again, I just want to say that Dr. Hotez has emerged as one of the leading defenders of vaccines in America. He, uh, as a vaccine scientist and an autism parent, he has led national efforts to defend vaccines and, um, and has been um, uh, really firm against a growing national anti-vax threat. And he has, you know, I, I don't know how you have survived all of the hate texts, mail, Twitters, et cetera, that have come your way but have continued to show um, remarkable courage in the face of all of that. So I'm gonna stop there and say thank you so much um, for joining us. It again, really is um, a, a privilege to have you here. Well, thank you. That's such a generous introduction. I almost don't wanna continue. Just let it, let it go at that and quit while you're ahead uh, uh, as the expression goes. So thank you. It's uh, great to join you even if it's virtual. Uh, this time around, I've led a, a lot of friends and colleagues at Emory University, including Dr. Armstrong, Dr. Stevens, uh, Dr. Del Rio, of course, Carlos and I go way back, and uh, Lila Wack Holburn used to work with us, and she's now at Emory, and so it's just a great group of people. And I'll talk a little bit about a collaboration that we've had quite a further with the Emory University Non-Human Primate Center uh, as well. Um, in case you're wondering where I am, uh, I'm actually in Washington, D.C. I'm uh, I'm in the executive office building of the White House right now. This is, I'm in the Hen Henry, that's Henry Stimson behind me over there. I'm in the uh, Henry Stimson uh, war room, uh, which may be sort of poetic and, and, and appropriate. Um, let me go share the slides and get, get started and uh, try to leave a uh, fair bit of time for questions because uh, because I think there's there's a lot to discuss and I'd really look forward to to your feedback as well. Uh, so I'll begin here. 
I started out like many of you as, as a medical student, in my case, an MD PhD student at Cornell and Rockefeller back in the 1980s, as Dr. Armstrong mentioned. Um, and, and at that time, to this day, the motto of Rockefeller University is science for the benefit of humanity it used to be the Rockefeller Institute for Medical Research. And I began working on a hookworm vaccine for my MD PhD thesis, which now 40 years later is look finally looks like it's working and and accelerating through clinical trials, which is about the right time frame for a lot of these uh, uh, vaccines. And then we also pivoted our program to make two low cost COVID vaccines. The point is, what I started to do 40 years ago, I'm more or less still doing today as a, a laboratory investigator aspiring to make low cost vaccines for neglected diseases for, for global health. And, and to this day, I'm still doing that. And that was the planned part. The unplanned part was having four adult kids, including Rachel has autism and intellectual disabilities and uh, wrote the book, Vaccines Did Not Cause Rachel's Autism, um, which wound up making me public enemy number one or two with anti-vaccine groups. And uh, this is when uh, our good friend Robert F. Kennedy Jr. started publicly declaring me the OG villain, which I'm so old and square, I had to look up what that meant, the original gangster villain. So thanks for inviting the original gangster villain uh, uh, today. But but even though that was unpleasant and, this, and, and the aggression has gotten pretty bad, it also gave me a front row seat to what the anti-vaccine movement is all about these last two decades and been able to follow it and chart it. And this is the new book that just came out a couple of months ago called The Deadly Rise of Anti-Science, are both published by Johns Hopkins University Press. Uh, so today what I wanna do is kind of give you the best and the worst of vaccines, the excitement of developing new vaccines, but also a very dark place that our nation has gone into combating uh, anti-vaccine, anti-science uh, activism. And I know you're facing it a lot as well in Georgia and Atlanta. So I'm at the Texas Medical Center. They say it's the world's largest. It's a medical city. We do everything big in Texas, 100,000 employees, 60 institutions, MD Anderson Cancer Center, Texas Children's Hospital, Baylor College of Medicine. On the bottom there is our new uh, biotech park called Helix Park in the shape of a double helix. It's supposed to be the first double helix you could see from space because we have NASA here as well. And so that's the excitement, and that was the draw for me, for us moving to Texas 13 years ago. On, on the right, uh, Texas is also a state of extremes and has become an epicenter of the anti-vaccine movement. So I want to really focus on the two aspects, uh, because I think, you know, combat, I'm slowly starting to realize that combating anti-vaccine activism may be as important in terms of saving lives as developing new vaccines. Not something I anticipated doing, but something I think is important. So um, creating the School of Tropical Medicine in, in, at the Texas Medical Center, but also we created this Center for Vaccine Development called the Texas Children's Hospital Center for Vaccine Development. And we have many collaborators and advisors from, from Emory um, uh, that have helped us in this. There were about 20 plus scientists. It's co-headed by myself and my science partner for the last 20 plus years, Dr. Mary Elena Batazzi. And, and and she's also spoken in Emory in the past. And these are the, sort of our portfolio of vaccines that we're making, mostly for parasitic infections, schistosomiasis, hookworm, Chagas disease, leishmaniasis. And then around 13 years ago, we started making coronavirus vaccines. It was a partnership with Lan Ying Du, uh, who's now in Georgia, and, um, and Shi Bu Jiang at the New York Blood Center. And they approached us, they had a very good idea for coronavirus vaccines, and they were orphaned just like parasitic disease vaccines are. So we took that project on as well, uh, developing coronavirus vaccines, which when the COVID-19 sequence hit in January of 2020, we were able to pivot our program and, and make that as well. Um, one of the things that we do is we uh, try to do cutting edge technologies like mRNA and particle vaccines, but we also do this. We also try to be compatible with vaccine producers in low and middle income countries. And there's about 40 of them that band together and call themselves the DCVMN, the Developing Country Vaccine Manufacturers Network. Uh, they're, in, they're in Asia, Africa, Latin America. And one of the most common technologies that they have is many make their own recombinant protein hepatitis B vaccine. Uh, this is done through 
It's a technology that's been around three decades. It's done through microbial fermentation and yeast, recombinant proteins done by genetically engineering either baker's yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, or methanol utilizing yeast, such as, as for a carbon source, such as Pichia pastoris or Hensenula. And what's nice about it is there's no limit to the amount you can make. It tends to be very inexpensive. In our case, we've been doing this for about $3 a dose. Uh, it's uh, very safe technology um, that we've seen so far. Uh, no minimal serious adverse uh, events or, or any adverse events. So it's well accepted by parents, simple refrigeration. So when you start going through the checklist, you realize that it's a pretty good technology for global health vaccines. And so the idea that we conceived was we'll develop the prototype vaccine um, uh, in our labs at Texas Children's Hospital and then literally send it, the production cell bank by World Courier or other mechanisms to the host country where we work with them on the scale up production. We'll, we'll work it out at the 20, 30 liter fermenter scale, and then they have to scale it up to a, a larger scale and, and transfer the ownership. So they, they own the technology. We don't try to hang on to it. And that has actually worked reasonably well. Um, and it provides, I think, an alternative model. It's uh, to the pharma companies, the big pharma companies, not to demonize the big pharma companies. They do make a lot of vac important vaccines for the Gavi Alliance, but our belief is there should be alternative uh, models. And so we've been doing this now for a number of years for two parasitic worm vaccines for human hookworm infection and schistosomiasis, um, which often go hand in hand. So they're often co-endemic as well as being co-endemic with malaria on the African continent. So where you see the purple shading on the map on the African continent, Southeast Asia, Latin America is where hookworm and schistosomiasis are present. Um, and I show the map because it, uh, presents another problem for us. Uh, imagine, you know, if you're the chief executive officer of a big pharma company or biotech, where your financial return is going to be in the U.S. and Canada, and North America, and Western Europe, and Japan, and 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 so if that if that's the case, this is probably not the map you would want in your business plan. So one of the things that we're trying to do is not only explore interest in science, but, you know, figuring out, is there a sustainable financial model uh, for this? And, and that one turns out to be as daunting as, as the science itself is, um, you know, it's one of the exciting things, doing something that no one's done before, making vaccines for people who can't afford to pay for them. Uh, but at the same time, it's also scary at times because there is, is no roadmap. Um, our, just a word about our hookworm vaccine, since we recently got a very exciting result. Um, our strategy for the hookworm vaccine is to take advantage of the blood feeding apparatus of the worm. Here's an adult hookworm um, shown on the lower left. It's about a centimeter long and it attaches to the inside lining of the gut of the small intestine, extracts blood out of capillaries or arterioles in the uh, lamina propria and, and submucosa. And then on the right is a cross section of a hookworm gut, a, car a cartoon of the hookworm gut showing you how it breaks apart blood, it breaks apart hemoglobin, it uses a hemolysin to open the red blood cells, and then it, by the enzymes, the proteases are attached to the brush border membrane of the gut, and it breaks down hemoglobin through a series of proteolytic enzyme steps. And it took us years to work this out through an aspartic protease, uh, a cysteine protease, a metalloprotease. And then the parasite has to do something with heme. So animals that feed on blood don't like heme because heme uh, generates toxic oxygen radicals, um, peroxidates lipid membranes and, and uh, lipids and membranes. And so malaria, for instance, uses two mechanisms to detoxify heme. When it feeds on hemoglobin, it, it has a glutathione S transferase that's specially adapted to bind up heme, and as well as it polymerizes the heme into a NERP pigment uh, known as hemozoin. Hookworms do something similar. They have a glutathione S transferase that binds uh, heme and uh, Toy and Asojo in our group worked out the X-ray crystal structure. It has minimal peroxidase function, but it, it binds up the heme. And it turned out it made a very good vaccine uh, in the laboratory. And um, so we're working towards getting an answer whether it works in humans. And to accelerate this, uh, the team that we were working with in Washington, D.C., before coming to Texas, we were in D.C., 
had worked on a human challenge model to infect normal human volunteers with hookworm larvae. They give 50 hookworm larvae uh, on the skin, and then uh, 10 to 15 of them become adult hookworms feeding on blood and producing eggs. This is worked out by uh, David DeMert and uh, uh, Jeff Bethany uh, in, in Washington, D.C. And the question is, what happens when we vaccinate first? And so um, this is the model. We give three immunizations and then the challenge of the hookworm uh, larvae and we recently got an extraordinary result that, I, that I'm very excited about. And this was um, briefly unveiled at the ASTMH meeting in Chicago uh, last fall, uh, although we still haven't published uh, the result. And this is with the GST molecule that was the most promising. So um, on, on the left, I'm showing you quantitative egg counts, which is a surrogate measure of number of worms. And on the left is the placebo, and then um, sort of the, the bluish one is the recombinant protein on our hydrogel. Um, so most of our recombinant protein vaccines are done uh, with aluminum salts. And then if we add CPG to it as a second immunostimulant, it had the dramatic result of uh, no seemingly no breakthrough infection. It seems to stop it at the level of larvae entering the gut. So almost 100% protection. And on the right, it kind of correlates with antibody. So it's it's a very exciting result. Now we're trying to understand what's next. Um, how much of a phase three clinical trial do we have to do um, in order to uh, achieve licensure or achieve prequalification with WHO and what the regulatory pathway is? Uh, you know, another big issue for us is who pays for the scale of production for our COVID vaccines that I'll talk about for a minute. In a minute, when we transferred the technology to India or Indonesia, the vaccine producers there had a guaranteed purchaser. The Indian government uh, or the Indonesian government made a commitment that if they produced it and showed it worked through clinical trials, they would buy it. We don't have that right now for the hookworm vaccine. So this is one of the things we struggle with is, again, the sustainable financial model. I think there is an answer there, but this is now a, a work in progress. And I'll be going to India in a few weeks to see if we can help uh, sort this out. And this was the situation that we faced with, with COVID-19. Um, this is a bubble map of where the world's population was not getting vaccinated in 2021. And, and both Carlos and I were, and others were wringing our hands about this, that people were not getting vaccinated on, on the African continent. The larger the bubble, the fewer the vaccinated people are, um, uh, or in, in India and Pakistan and, and Indonesia. So how do you, first of all, what was the problem? The problem in my view was a bit of a science policy failure. We were so fixed on speed and innovation that, um, and we got really interesting vaccines, the mRNA vaccines, um, particle vaccines, adenovirus vaccines. And, and of course, you know, I'm an MD, PhD scientist. I love the innovation as much as the next person. But you know, when you go to a brand new technology, there's a learning curve before you can get from zero to the 15 billion doses we need. And I think the flaw perhaps of Operation Warp Speed was being so fixed on speed and innovation that maybe there wasn't the situational awareness there to step step back and say, hey, wait a minute, maybe we should be producing more vaccines uh, locally and using technology that they could readily use. And that's where we stepped in. We transferred this with no minimal strings attached or no patents and that sort of thing to several countries. And uh, India went the furthest uh, biologically, the big vaccine producer in Hyderabad, scaled it up to make uh, Corbivax, and that wound up reaching 100 million people, and Indonesia did something similar. So I think it provided proof of concept that, you know, there are other paths to vaccine development, which is important. Um, for our vaccine technology, we focus, Shibu Jie and Lan Ying Du, when they were at the New York Blood Center, showed for SARS and MERS, the original SARS that came out of Southern China in 2002, then Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, the receptor binding domain was a highly effective uh, vaccine um, in the laboratory uh, challenge model um, without with minimizing immune enhancement. So we took that approach and then had to work out a few things on how you deal with it as you scale up and produce it. So for instance, that N-terminal asparagine in the red box there, we got rid of that because it was glycosylated interfering with immunity. And then in the green box, we switched a cysteine to an alanine because the cysteine was forming an intermolecular disulfide bond. You might say, well, that's not really amazing chemistry, and, and you're right, but it took us time to work out. And then the other thing that we do is we publish every step of our process in the public 
domain. And so, because our scientists not only have a biotechnology problem to solve, they're also academics. So they have faculty appointments. So it's an interesting hybrid of a blend of biotech with, with university. And it's always a work in progress, but it seems to be working. And then we scaled up the production of our vaccines uh, at, at our laboratories at Texas Children's Hospital and, and the Feigen Center. Uh, and then uh, in collaboration with you, with, with the Emory University Non-Human Primate uh, Center with uh, Sridhar Kasturi and, and colleagues um, were able to show that it was highly uh, protective against challenge infection. The lungs looked pristine and, and the great inhibition of virus replication. So we knew we had a great vaccine and it was now a matter of uh, trying to do the tech transfer. And so this was what my life was like in early 2020. If you've ever done business with African or Asian countries, you know what that means. You get up pretty early in the morning to do a Zoom call uh, in order to uh, uh, get to them by close of business. And so that was interesting. And then at that time, both Carlos and myself we were going late into the night talking to Don Lemon or Lawrence O'Donnell. So not much sleep for three years, but we were able to do the transfer and then also raising money for it because we weren't part of Operation Warp Speed. So it was a stressful time, but we were able to do this with several countries and India went the furthest, made Corbivax. Indonesia made another version called Indovac. Bangladesh actually did a very good job, but then at the last minute, kind of they got the rug pulled out from under them. The Bangladeshi government decided to move forward and purchase Pfizer. Uh, vaccines. And then uh, Botswana in Southern Africa is, is making progress. And um, and then when we transfer the ownership, we say, look, um, it's up to you to work out with your national regulatory authority in India, it's the DCGI and WHO, how to do the clinical trials, how to do the data sharing. You know, we don't try to hang on to that and then work out with the World Health Organization, the WHO pre-qualification which happened rather late in the game, but after 100 million doses got administered and showed that the level of virus neutralizing the antibody was right up there with mRNA vaccines and better than the adenovirus and the inactivated virus vaccines and then stepped on studies in kids. So by this time, two years ago, um, this had been widely given uh, across India. It was the primary immunization for 75 million uh, adolescents. So it was very exciting for that to happen. And with Indonesia, um, another interesting twist, they worked in our, they came into our laboratories because we had told them everything we do is with a non-animal or human source protein and no, no human or animal cells. In that sense, it's kind of a vegan or a vegetarian technology. So as a consequence, uh, they were able to work with their clergy and get it certified as halal, which, you know, is something when you started in this business, you never really thought about, but that was kind of interesting as well. It turned out to be one of the first halal COVID vaccines. And now we're making the um, XBB booster version, and that's rapidly accelerating. It should be available soon. Low cost, $3 a, a dose. So, so it, it goes to show you that you don't have to be a big pharma company to still do big projects. And, and I think that's an important message. Let me switch gears a little bit because now, you know, we're kind of hopefully getting on the other side of COVID. We're certainly not there yet, but I, I hope, hope we'll get there. And and now the World Health Organization and the Gavi Alliance is starting to think, okay, what happens next? And, and the World Health Organization has launched their new immunization agenda 2030, primarily to say, okay, now because of COVID-19, there's been a lot of social disruptions as well as supply chain interruptions. And we have gaps now in our ability to vaccinate the world's kids. Um, we've had steady progress for two decades since the launch of the Gavi Alliance in the year 2000, um, reaching 86% of the world's kids being immunized. But now things are starting to get leaky and, and we're, we're creating these gaps in immunization. And so the World Health Organization is committed to this catch-up campaign that they literally call the big uh, catch-up. And um, here are some numbers from WHO. They're, they have found that the global coverage has dropped from 86% in 2019 to 81% in 2021. You might say, well, okay, not a big drop, but it's the first time it's gone in the wrong direction. And in 2021, the number of completely unvaccinated kids has increased by 5 million. So, so there's a worry. and and. 
and my worry is this, that it's not only the social disruption from COVID-19 or diversion of resources or supply chain interruptions, that there's something else going on that's preventing us, that's going to prevent us from getting back to baseline. Um, that's a picture of me in the monk painting over there that it's happening because of this rise in global anti-vaccine activism. Now that US style anti-vaccine movement is not being exported globally. And I believe that's something new and ominous has happened. And it's one of the reasons why I'm in the White House today is to talk about um, wh what's happened with, with that uh, anti-vaccine uh, ecosystem. So I wanna just finish up kind of giving you my personal view on, on all of this, just from having a front row seat because of Rachel and, and going up against them early on, I've been able to kind of watch how this anti-vaccine movement has evolved or devolved over time to become a, what I consider a very dangerous movement. And, and so we'll start out, let me just give you a brief 25 year tour through version 1.0, which started out with falsely claiming that vaccines cause autism. Then version 2.0 started about a decade ago, became more of a political movement around health freedom, medical freedom, and then now globalizing. So let me just take you through briefly 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, and then we can stop and, and have some discussion. So what, even within 1.0, there's a lot of nuance or, or shifts or what some people call moving goalposts, others might call whack-a-mole. You knock down one assertion, another one pops up. So the original assertion was from the Wakefield paper in the Lancet 1998, claiming that it was the live viruses and the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, MMR vaccine that was uh, replicating in the colon and, and 12 kids, and then somehow leading to pervasive developmental disorder or autism. And that was debunked and, and shown not to be the case, and the paper was retracted. Um, but that didn't stop a growing anti-vaccine movement. And then the next iteration of that was uh, our friend Robert F. Kennedy Jr. wrote an article in Rolling Stone a magazine claiming that it was the thimerosal preservative that used to be a vaccine related to the mercury component thimerosal that was also retracted and shown not to be the case. And 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 in both cases, uh, large cohort studies were done, probably some of them by faculty at Emory, showing that kids who got either MMR uh, vaccine or, uh, or thimerosal containing vaccines we're no more likely to acquire autism than kids who didn't. And that should have been the end of it, but they kept on being this kind of switch up. So then it was spacing vaccines too close together. And then it was alum in vaccines. And then for a while they switched to HPV vaccine for cervical cancer and other cancers falsely claiming it caused infertility or autoimmunity. And that sounds familiar for COVID-19. That's where they got it from. They just copy pasted the false assertion uh, from they got from HPV and sort of glommed it on to COVID-19 vaccines or the claim that vaccines are just causing chronic illness. So it became more and more problematic to combat. And so um, that's how I got involved. That's a picture of me with Rachel, um, who's uh, now 31 years old. She has autism and intellectual disabilities and wrote the book, which does a deep dive explaining the science, showing why they're showing there's no link, but also providing an alternative narrative, how autism um, and of course, there's wonderful work going on at uh, Emory University in the Autism Center by Ami Glenn and others, showing how autism begins in early fetal brain development. Now we know through the action of autism genes, there's at least 100 of them that have been identified, um, um, many of them at the Broad Institute at Harvard MIT. We actually did whole exome genomic sequencing on Rachel and my wife, Anne and I, to find Rachel's autism gene. Um, like Rachel's, many of them are neuronal cytoskeleton genes involved in neuronal uh, connections. And in fact, at the end of last year, it was a really beautiful study done at Stanford Medical School using brain organoids, um, using neurons that had uh, autism genes and showing uh, aberrant migration in, in the neurons. So um, I can't say the story is totally airtight yet, but it's getting close to it. The point is, you know, it wasn't enough to tell parents, hey, don't blame the vaccines. You needed that alternative narrative. And I think we have that now. And and I think that also helped take some of the wind out of the sails of anti-vaccine groups, but they found a way to regroup in a way that I would not have anticipated. And and that started in the 2010. So, and, and like so many trends, it began in California, and, but was amplified in Texas. So in California, by the 2010, so many 
kids were not getting vaccines because parents were concerned about autism, that um, there were, we started to see breakthrough childhood infections. And classically, what we see first is measles because it's so highly transmissible, just like what's going on in Florida uh, right now. And there was a big one in Orange County in 2014, 2015. It was also in Marin County. And, and the California legislature responded appropriately by shutting down vaccine exemptions. They said, from now on, you want to send your kids to school, your kids have to be vaccinated. And I supported that and had the immediate effect of halting um, uh, breakthrough uh, measles epidemics. But it also did produce a backlash around this concept of health freedom, medical freedom. And it really took off in Texas, where it got adopted by the Republican Tea Party in Texas. And, and here's where it gets hard to talk about, because it's hard to talk about without talking about politics. And that makes us very uncomfortable, right? Because as physicians or scientists or healthcare professionals, we're always told, well, you know, we shouldn't really talk about politics. We have to be politically neutral. We don't talk about Republicans or Democrats or liberals or conservatives or red states or blue states. But, you know, I haven't found a way to talk about it other than to talk about it. So I talk about it or write about it. Not, not that I care about people's political views. That, that's your right as an American citizen. But somehow to say, how do you uncouple the anti-vaccine, anti-science rhetoric from it? Because it's become so literally deadly. So this is what took off uh, in, in Texas, where anti-vaccine groups started getting PAC money, political action committee money. And then you saw the podcasters in Texas, like Alex Jones, pile on. And the consequence of that was a big increase in the number of kids not getting their vaccines. And these are um, the number of kids not getting their full complement of vaccines that we know about, because we also have about 700,000 homeschooled kids in Texas. And we don't really have any handle on how many of those are not getting their vaccine? So this started to become a huge public health problem, huge numbers of kids not getting their vaccines. And unfortunately, that health freedom, medical freedom movement is what took off during this time of COVID. And here's a paper I wrote two years, almost two years ago called The Great Texas COVID Tragedy. And it looks at the 100,000 deaths from COVID in the state of Texas. So Texas is one of the worst affected states. Uh, of any state, 100,000 deaths. It's the top of the list. California is also high, but of course, California is 40 million people, Texas 30 million. And, and here's the pattern of deaths, which will look relatively familiar to you. So this is in Texas. So I have date here on the x-axis, 2020, 2021, 2022. And on the y-axis is daily deaths. And that first peak um, was when COVID hit in the summer in Texas and then with the original lineage. And here's the alpha wave in the winter of 2021. Here's the delta wave in the last half of 2021. And here's the BA1 Omicron wave in the beginning of 2022. And this big green arrow signifies arguably, arguably even a little bit before when vaccines became freely and widely available. Anybody want to get an mRNA vaccine could, probably even earlier going into April, um, but the point is, if you look at these deaths, you see that almost as many Texans died after the Green Arrow as before the Green Arrow, uh, because so many Texans refused to get a COVID vaccine that was more than 90% protective against the Delta uh, variant. And that was so heartbreaking to see that almost half of the deaths were unnecessary. Let me give you a comparison. Uh, the nation of Canada, which has a population about the same size as, as Texas, um, and uh, 30 million plus people, they had 50,000 deaths as opposed to 100,000 deaths. Why? Because after their green arrow, a lot of those deaths halted because people were accepting of, more accepting of vaccines. In Texas, the deaths kept on plowing on because nobody was getting, so many people refused to get vaccinated, particularly in the conservative areas of the state in East Texas, Central Texas, uh, up in the panhandle. And that was replicated in other um, states in the country, including Georgia, including Arkansas, uh, Oklahoma. So globally, uh, nationally, I estimate about 200,000 Americans needlessly lost. And truly heartbreaking um, to think so. The idea that you know this anti-vaccine movement is not just some theoretical construct. It has now become a killing force in the United States. Now what I want to do is look at this from the political perspective. So I want you to look at this. There is this, I'm gonna show you this Delta wave again by a political divide. And this was done by Charles Gabba, the health analyst with ACA signups. And, and there is that Delta wave again of deaths 
by the political divide, but it's been reproduced by the New York Times, by Axios, by National Public Radio. In fact, uh, what it shows is that uh, the deaths are overwhelmingly in red states, red being Republican, blue being Democrat, and the redder the county, the lower the immunization rate and higher the death rate, so much so that David Leonhardt of the New York Times just calls it red COVID. So what was going on? In my view, it began at the CPAC Conference of Conservatives in, in 2021 over the summer uh, that was held in Dallas, Texas, where the rhetoric was, first they'll vaccinate you, then they'll take away your guns and your Bibles. And as ridiculous as that sounds to us, people in my state of Texas accepted that and across the South. And so what was happening is in their effort to uh, go up against vaccine mandates, um, what they were doing is going that extra measure and falsely discrediting the effectiveness and safety of vaccines. So all of the prominent anti-vaccine activists were brought on to the CPAC conference. Um, the Associated Press wrote an article about this entitled, uh, they clapped the death for COVID, literally cheering on um, not vaccinating uh, the American people. And then the pylon came. And unfortunately, the pylon came from members of the House Freedom Caucus, including a representative from Georgia, as well as Ohio, and Senator Rand Paul, Senator Ron Johnson held these vaccine injury roundtables and then amplified every night on Fox News. And this was documented by two groups. Media Matters, a watchdog group, as well as uh, a research group out of the Federal University of Science and Technology in Switzerland, ETH Zurich, where actually where Einstein studied, and found that every night during that Delta wave, Tucker Carlson, Laura Ingram, Sean Hannity filled their broadcasts, which were the most widely watched broadcasts on TV, 3 million viewers a night, with anti-vaccine content. And so you went down that rabbit hole and you didn't get vaccinated and you paid for it with, with your life. And so how do you how do we manage this is, is a big question. Uh, and how do we talk about it? And, and I like this comment from Sir Joseph Rothblatt, who's a, a nuclear physicist who was an immigrant from Poland and the UK, came to the US, worked on the Manhattan Project, and then afterwards um, uh, a campaign for nuclear disarmament and created the Pugwash Conference, which won the Nobel Prize. And, there's a nice quote, I like this very much. It says, precepts such as science is neutral, or science has nothing to do with politics still prevail. They are remnants of the ivory tower mentality, although the ivory tower was finally demolished by the Hiroshima bomb. Um, so, you know, I guess part of the message is we do need to talk about politics, not because we want to, but if we're committed to saving lives, I think it's important. Of course, um, uh, that's not well understood, and, and I become a, a big target, and you know, your life is interesting when Steve Bannon calls you a criminal. Um, uh, and, you know, basically the rhetoric, you showed how Fauci was bad, way to get a load of this guy. And 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 it takes a very dark tone very quickly. Um, that's one of the better pictures of me. And and then the stalkings and the and the, the threats, and you have to bring in the Houston Police Department and, and the FBI when it goes across borders. And some of the emails are interesting. I'll show them to you, not because I want to shock you, but because I think you learn something from them. So here's one, just put everything in the subject line here. Uh, doctor, I use that term loosely, Hotez, you print one more paper or blog suggesting the roundup of free citizens, which of course I don't, but you know, this is the health freedom, medical freedom propaganda to get an unproven, untested shot, which of course it's not. That is no more a vaccine than an M&M is. And I will suggest all my Patriot friends can be hunted. You know, the idea that the army of Patriots is coming to pump this down or, or soon the Republicans will be back in charge investigating your sorry ass. And there's a lot of Nazi imagery that they like, like to use as an excuse to show Nazi imagery. And so one of the QAnon fantasies is that there'll be a day of reckoning for the virologists and the vaccine scientists that they call Nuremberg too, that uh, tribunals like at Nuremberg after uh, uh, for the Nazi war crimes will be resurrected to try the vaccine scientists and you'll be charged with treason other crimes against humanity, you'll be sent to hang by the news of the dead. I'll celebrate the day I see you hanging from the gallows. So this has sort of been going nonstop now for a couple of years and it's starting to increase. And unfortunately, it's not getting better, it's getting worse. And what you're seeing now after pointing out that 200,000 Americans needlessly died, um, rather than pause for self-reflection, you're seeing a doubling down. And this is playing out now in the House subcommittee on COVID-19 where on their official Twitter site, they literally say they're going to sell popcorn. 
quote unquote. So it's not even pretending this is anything other than Fox News sound bites or political theater. And but unfortunately, they're dragging prominent American scientists in front of C-SPAN cameras to try to humiliate them, and, and it's very very damaging for the country. Um, you know, they're basically doubling down, saying, no, no, it was the COVID vaccines that killed Americans, not COVID, which is ridiculous, or that the scientists invented the virus through gain of function, uh, which is also ridiculous and been discredited, um, uh, or that this it's all, it's all the fault of the scientists because they didn't communicate honestly, which is also highly uh, misleading. Um, not that I deserve the comparison with Galileo, but I'll, I'll take it anyway. Um, and I think this is my last slide or next to last slide. Now it's globalizing. We're starting to see this, first of all, extend to other childhood Im immunizations beyond COVID. And I think that's what's playing out now in the state of Florida with the comments of the Florida Surgeon General. Um, it's globalizing. We're seeing those same U.S. style anti-vaccine rhetoric uh, uh, going into low and middle income countries on the African continent, even in Latin America, you know, like you, you know, being in close proximity to Latin America, uh, I often present at pediatric societies in Colombia and Mexico and Central American countries. And historically, I've always congratulated the pediatricians for kind of holding the line and not letting U.S. anti-vaccine activism contaminate Latin American countries. That's changing now. I think we're really starting to see this breakthrough, and that's really tragic. And, and lastly, this is a, a new book that I've now started working on with Michael Mann, the climate scientist, where we're comparing the attacks on climate science, which precede, preceded those of biomedicine with the attacks on biomedicine. There's not complete overlap, but there's a significant amount of overlap. So let me stop there and um, see if we have some time for questions. Uh, uh, Dr. Armstrong, I'm in your hands, so however you'd like to proceed. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, thank you. It's really um, a little bit chilling, a lot chilling, actually, what you, you're showing. Um, so for everybody, please feel free to raise your hand or put your questions in the chat. Um, this is like the uh, the sort of softball, uh, I guess, or hard, but it, it's not an easy question to answer, but what, what's the end game here? Like, where do you see this going? Is there any, um, is there any rainbow at the end of this, or are we really on a road to... Well, you know, um, you know, as as Martin Luther King says, the moral arc of the universe does eventually bend towards justice. Uh, I don't see it happening anytime soon, though. Um, uh, I think things are going to continue to heat up up until the twenty twenty four election, and then I don't know. You know, what's interesting is everyone's kind of perseverating on whether Trump's in the White House or Biden in the White House. I have an additional worry because it's the harassment of the scientists now is coming out of the House GOP and Senate. You know, I've got, you know, bizarre questions coming from members of, of Congress. And so that, I don't see how, you know, that could, that, that will, could likely continue, you know, even um, after November, even after November. So that, that, that's a big concern. You know, in the past, we've always seen this kind of autocorrection, right? If there was a measles outbreak, Parents would learn about it. They'd hear about kids going into the hospital or even in the intensive care unit, the pediatric ICU, and, and parents would get it and they'd scramble. You do a catch-up vaccination. We're not doing that in Florida now, are we? I mean, and, and so I think uh, I, I worry about a uh, permanent, uh, I don't know what metaphor you want to use, uh, tear in the matrix or a, a break in the ecosystem. Uh, so I, you know, I do hope, I'm hopeful it will eventually auto correct, but I, I don't see this happening soon. And I think an important first step though, is at least describing the system. Cause if you don't describe it, then you can't at least chip away at it. But even that's getting harder. Vivek Murthy, the Surgeon General has, you know, issued an advisory in 2021 about the social media companies um, trying to get them to switch up computer algorithms algorithms. Now he's being sued by the Missouri Attorney General. There's a case going on, Missouri versus Murthy, that's even blocking his ability to combat the disinformation. So not only are they promoting disinformation, preventing you from combating any response to it. So that gets very tough. I think that's the longest, I don't know the answer to your question answer in a while. Um, I, I knew there was no straightforward question answer to that question. Dr. Del Rio. 
So, Peter, another simple question. Um, what can we, what can the residents, medical students, faculty watching this do, and, and how do we all unite in, in addressing this very complex issue? So, I, you know, one of the things that I, I actually talked about today in the White House is um, um, the, the, the internists and the OBs um, I think need to feel more comfortable with the vaccine ecosystem. One of the, one of the observations a number of us has made it has been calls or emails we're getting from from their internists saying, "Hey, doc, I was going to get that RSV vaccine, but my physician said, let's wait and see." Or the COVID booster, let's wait and see. I think you know, we've had all these new adult immunizations come online right, in the last couple of years. I mean, you've had flu for a while, but now you have COVID, you have Shingrix, you have the RSV vaccine, um, Prevnar. And I think we need to see a better comfort level with the, the pediatricians have been at this for decades, so they have a real comfort level with the vaccine ecosystem. I think the internists and the OB, OB guys need to have that same level of comfort because I'm still hearing a lot of hesitancy and, 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 and not pushback, but skittishness about, um, about vaccines. And I think that's, and all these adult vaccines are gonna become so important. So that, that is the next frontier with, with vaccines or adult immunization. So I think getting comfortable with that, learning how to have that discussion with, with patients is going to be extremely important. Um, uh, but it's getting tougher too, right? Because now people are tying their identity to not getting vaccinated. So I'm also hearing stories of, of patients firing their physicians because they suggested getting an mRNA vaccine. Um, and basically the patient literally walking out indignant that the physician would even suggest getting an mRNA booster. So that's, that's really awful as well. So um, that that's going to that's going to be a, a big next step, I think. And particularly now, with a lot of discussions about fall respiratory season, the thinking being that now there's going to be this full complement of vaccines in the fall for flu, for COVID, maybe for RSV, and and of course Prevnar as well. And so I think that's going to be a, a big challenge. So so let me so let me let me follow up on that. Do you think we made a mistake with the way we communicated COVID vaccines. You know, initially vaccines were designed to prevent severe disease. Then when we saw they prevented infection, we were all excited about it. But the reality is they did very poorly doing that. And we still cannot get away. People say, look, the vaccine doesn't prevent me from getting infected. So why should I get it? I mean, we didn't we didn't market this appropriately, quite frankly. Yeah, there, there was that miscommunication. Um, so, you know, when these COVID vaccines were rolled out, it was, if you know, as we know, they were rolled on the basis of stopping symptomatic illness. And but it was in in the beginning of 2021, the Israelis showed that wait a minute, you know, with the original lineage, the level of virus neutralizing the antibody is so high that it looks like it's getting into the nasal mucosa and throat washings and actually stopping virus shedding and and therefore asymptomatic transmission. And that's why the mask came off. Um, although I'm not sure the CDC articulated that as, as well as they, they could. And, and then when the virus mutated to the Delta variant, I think that's the first performance function we lost. Was, I mean, I still, still think there was some effect on reducing virus transmission, but it wasn't as robust. And you started to see breakthrough infection and even symptomatic illness, even though they were doing a good job at keeping people out of the hospital. But I think that could have been communicated in a more detailed way. I think sometimes we simplify communication too much or try to dumb it down. And I think that was probably a mistake because there was a lot of nuance to, to all of this. Having said that, I think um, I think one of the new narratives that people are kind of putting out there is saying that the reason why there's mistrust in science and health is because we didn't communicate properly. I think that's also misleading. I think, yeah, there were some there's some gaffes and some mistakes, but I still say that was about 10% of the problem because the overwhelming issue was the weaponization by by nefarious forces seeking to um, uh, either downplay the significance of the pandemic, push hydroxychloroquine or ivermectin or 
or falsely discredit the effectiveness and safety of vaccines. But that's part of the revisionist history now is to blame us and say we were terrible communicators. What I would say is we were imperfect communicators, but the truth is it wasn't all that terrible, um, but at every step it was weaponized by people with either a political or a financial agenda. Um, thanks. Uh, so, Dr. Tatanji uh, has a question in the chat. I don't know if you're in a place where you can unmute BK. He says, how can pharmaceutical companies? Yeah, uh, yeah so I think the first one actually, how do you, do you have thoughts on how AI will impact the anti vaccine landscape and ways to preemptively tackle this area or prepare for it? She was um, uh, telling us about the uptake of malaria vaccine in um, the African subcontinent recently. Yeah, I, mean, I think with the pharma companies, you know, one of the problems that we had with Moderna and Pfizer was, you know, they, they had no constraints on their press release. So that was part of the problem with Operation Warp Speed. And they tended to spectacularize their accomplishment, making it sound like these vaccines appeared out of nowhere. And it wasn't true, right? I mean, there has been more than 15 years of work showing how you deliver the spike protein, why the spike protein is a target. You know, the mRNA technology that won the Nobel Prize and Penn for 15 years of work. So the idea that these vaccines were miracles, well, why did they write that? They did it because they're, those press releases are meant for their shareholders to jack up the stock prices. And it was tone deaf to the fact of how that would be received by the American people. So I think that that was a problem. And it doesn't help also that after taking $25 billion in U.S. taxpayer support, for either advanced development costs in the case of Moderna or for advanced purchase from both Pfizer and Moderna, they respond by jacking up the price to $130 a dose. I mean, I mean, guys, do you want the American people to hate you? I mean, so we've we've got to so so I think that that there there has to be some of that also, you know, with the pharma companies as well. But again, it's that very aggressive piece that's coming out of people with political uh, motivation and financial motivation. Dr. Stevens. Uh, uh, Peter, thanks for the coming and delivering. Uh, uh, first, the uh, first congratulations on your work with Hookworm. That sounds really exciting and, and looks like that's moving forward uh, in, a, in a really positive way in a, in a very needed uh, area. I, I guess my question is about uh, public health and just your comments about the public health issues, our, our officials. Uh, we see that, as you mentioned, in Florida now with the Surgeon General of Florida uh, uh, issuing is, uh, or making statements that are not correct in terms of public health policy. But just your comments on where we're going with public health and officials that seem to be following the anti-vaccine movement. Yeah, and not only just public health officials, but you know, we have prominent physicians at major medical schools, right? Including Johns Hopkins and Stanford and UCSF, really promoting a campaign of, of disinformation. And 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 it's so damaging, you know, even though they're not specialists in infectious diseases, the public just sees the name of the medical school or or and coming from the Florida Surgeon General. So uh, these individuals aren't doing a lot of damage or others who are, you know, holding these um, uh, uh, telemedicine consultations, charging whatever it is, a thousand dollars a pop to give people ivermectin or hydroxychloroquine, also doing a lot of damage. So how do, how do we get our medical profession and public health profession to self-regulate and to, and to, create some kind of disincentive for them to be promoting this because that is certainly causing a lot of damage. And, and, and then the question is how much does, you know, when, when the surgeon, Florida Surgeon General comes out with statements saying mRNA vaccines are causing turbo cancer, whatever a turbo cancer is, I mean, it's a made up term, you know, how aggressively to counteract that in public, you know, from the official government channels versus having people like Carlos or myself or others who are, you know, off and on cable news channels doing it as kind of surrogates. And I think everyone is, is wringing their hands about that. But, you know, how aggressive to respond to the disinformation versus uh, the downside of calling attention to it. I, I think we've tended to make the mistake of 
uh, of silence and and too often and i think that's had an enabling of uh, uh, effect that allows allows this kind of stuff to go on and i think we do need a more vigorous um, and vocal response to tamp it down because things go viral very quickly literally and figuratively thank you I think we have time for sort of one more question, Dr. Parker. By the way, you're always welcome to email me. As I like to say, the anti-vaxxers have my email, so you're welcome to have it as well. It's just Hotez, last name, at BCM, sounds for Baylor College of Medicine, .edu, and just put in the chat that you're part of this in the subject line, because you can imagine what the inbox looks like these days. <laughs> Um, thanks. So I think um, we can close out on Dr. Parker's question. What role do you see for academic health centers in times where health misinformation is being increasingly weaponized? So what do, what do we do as academics? You should I, I think a few things. Them. I think I think one is, you know, we, we, we need the support of the academic health centers. We need the leadership of the academic health centers to be out there supporting us because, you know, when, when you're out in the public domain, speaking about the stuff you're getting attacked, and and not not that I want to compare us to Martin Luther King, but you know he once said it's not just the words of the enemies; it's the silence of the friends. And so I think that we we need to hear more from the college presidents, um, the the dean, the executive deans, the presidents of academic health centers across the country, that you know to know that. They have our back and that we're not just being kind of hung out to dry. And I, I've said this as well with the National Academies and with the scientific societies, with the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, with, with, with PCAST, that we need to that we need to be hearing more from our institutions and not just take this very risk averse position where they're afraid to speak out because they don't want to get attacked. I think. I think that's that is going to be extremely important. And then, you know, for the handful of physicians who are uh, putting out disinformation, how you rein that in? I I wish I knew the answer. I I, I know that there, free speech issues are important, but there's also something called professionalism and ethics as well. And and how do we balance that? And how do we um, slow the the disinformation that's coming out of a lot of important academic health centers. Well, on that um, really important note, I'm going to close us out. Thank you again so much for spending your time with us today and for your work, um, which for which we well, are. Thank very you. Grateful. You're you're all doing amazing work. I you, you know the Emory University Medical School Department of Medicine has my undying admiration. I think you guys are amazing and. Congratulations on all your successes that I read about all the time, and uh, and I look forward to staying in touch with you. No, thank you so much.